Good evening. I'm Dino Dave, and our topic for this evening is giants. Giants. Did you know the Bible has a lot to say about giants? And I find most people only know about one giant in the Bible. Who's that? Goliath, of course, right? Everybody's familiar with David and Goliath. But actually, there's multiple giants that are mentioned in the Bible. We'll talk about some of them through the course of our presentation this evening. But let's talk about this topic of giants. Now, some might come to you and say, wait a minute, you're Dino Dave and you do presentations on origins. What about giants? How do they fit into the origins debate? It actually does have a pretty significant bearing on the origins debate because if we could boil down the creation model and the evolutionary model to just some real core tenets, we might put three on the creation model and three on the evolution model. We would have origin by design. That is, this universe, this world, the life forms on it were created. And at best, they have held pretty level or they've gone downhill. Things have decreased in order. And then this concept of catastrophism, that the great geological formations on planet Earth were formed quickly in a catastrophe. Over against that, we have the evolution model. That is a naturalistic origin. Uh, things have come about by chance and by natural selection. And you have to get from molecules to man. And so it might not always be going up at a straight angle, increasing in order. It might be bouncing around. It might have some ups and downs. But hey, the evolutionists have a hard enough time explaining how all the sophisticated uh, genetic systems round about us happened in the time frame that they're proposing. And so you have to get fairly quickly moving forward from molecules to man over time. And then uniformitarian gradualism. And so it's that second tenet, decrease in order versus increasing order, that has some impact on this topic of giants. If we're talking about giant people or even giant organisms in the distant past, that fits really well within the creation model. We're going to have three points of outline this evening. We're going to talk about the pre-flood Nephilim. We're going to talk about post-flood giant races. And we're going to wrap up with a very specific example, the American mound builders. And that'll be fun, and you'll have to wait for our last point for that. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4 says this, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now, this is a very significant verse. In fact, there's this uh, rule in uh, biblical exposition that the first mention of any particular topic in the Bible is always very important. It kind of sets the tone for the Bible's discussion on that topic as you continue to move through the Word of God. And this is the first mention of giants. And uh, we've got some really intriguing little phrases here. Uh, it says that there was at least two times in Earth's history, where giants played an important part in biblical history. Now, the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So there's at least two, maybe more. There's these multiple situations where giants play an important role. And then it talks about this phrase, the sons of God. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But these sons of God is an important phrase. And then down to the end, it talks about them being men of renown. Now, quick question for you. Put on your thinking caps for just a second. Men of renown or men of history. Think back to your history classes, maybe your textbooks. What would be the occupation of the people that fill our history textbooks? By and large, what would be, what would be their occupation? What would they do to have made history? Yeah, scientists, okay, yeah, we'll have some scientists more in modern times, but think back even biblical times or, you know, even in ancient times, medieval times, the times of the great uh, Babylonian, Greek, Roman empires. Uh, yeah, captains of war. So military leaders, right? So military leaders are men of renown. We see lots of military leaders in history books. Who else? Kings, yes, absolutely. In fact, we have two books in the Bible called Kings. So the rulers or the military leaders are some of the most important folks in history, changing the whole course of nations, leading nations, kind of dictating the directions of civilization in their day. 
So when we think of men of renown, we're going to find these giants are military men and they are rulers. That's the prediction that's made all the way back in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4. Now, who are the sons of God? Who are the sons of God? We don't know for sure. We just don't. But there are three common interpretations of who these are. And I'm going to just put all three of them there on the table. and We'll talk about each one in turn. The most recent view to kind of come into sway is the royalty view. That is, these people that are called, quote, unquote, sons of God are rulers, kings in the ancient antediluvian world that fancy themselves to be gods with a little g. And so they think of themselves as gods, but in reality, there's a dynasty of kings considered maybe by their subjects to be divine. And they take these, these uh, women, they have these huge harems. So obviously it's wrong to make yourself into a god, but then what they do is wrong in taking these huge harems. Now, that could explain how they would be men of renown. They would be rulers, but it doesn't explain the giant part. Like, why would they be giants? That there just really isn't any reason why they would have or give birth to these, these giants. And the Hebrew word there clearly is a giant. And the word in the Septuagint, uh, the Greek word, is also giant. And so uh, it has some difficulties. The royalty view really has some difficulties with that. And then there's this view called the Sethite view. This is another common interpretation. None of these are anti-biblical. They're all, you know, good men have some different ideas here on this. And the Sethite view goes like this. So Adam had Cain and Abel. Cain was wicked, murderous, killed his brother Abel. And then the Bible says that they had another son, Seth, and then began people to call upon the name of the Lord. So it would seem that Cain had this wicked progeny, and off he went with his family, and they were bad. And they didn't serve God. They followed Cain's way. But then they had Seth, and Seth's children had this knowledge of God, and men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So it seemed like at least for some time there was a godly lineage of Seth, and there was a wicked lineage of Cain. And so the Sethite view says, well, maybe uh, the sons of God are some of these godly line of Seth, and they're coming over here and saying, hey, there's some pretty girls amongst the daughters of men, these, these uh, Canaanite girls. And so we're going to take some of them, and we're going to marry them. Now, that could explain maybe why God was upset, because this compromise was going on. Again, it has difficulty explaining how you're getting giants, unless maybe it stops some of the inbreeding, and maybe that causes there to be some slightly larger offspring, uh, perhaps. But it has a bigger issue, and that is, by the time of Noah... The whole world is corrupt. The only one that's righteous is Noah. And so this is happening right before Noah and the flood. And God is getting upset at these sons of God taking these daughters of women and, and bringing about the flood as part of his judgment on this. And there isn't anybody righteous. So why would there be these sons of God at this point? There really aren't. Noah's the only one that's righteous. Uh, there's a third view, and this is called the fallen angel view. This is the idea that they were actually angels who left their angelic estate and took on human forms, married earthly women, and produced this hybrid offspring, kind of half angel, half human, kind of these monsters, and they were these giants. Now, you might say, that sounds really strange. I mean, angels are spirits, right? How can they produce offspring? Uh, and, and that's a real objection to this, but we might remember that angels can take on human form, and in fact, the angels came to Lot there in Sodom, and the men of Sodom wanted to have homosexual relations with these angels, and these angels reached out and actually took Lot and his daughters and wife and dragged them out, physically dragged them out. Other places we read about angels actually eating, so angels can take on a human form. Some will say, well, wait a minute, uh, aren't angels unmarried? And it does say, Jesus says in the New Testament that someday when we get to heaven, there'll be no marriage or given in marriage, but we like the angels of heaven. But we're not talking about the angels of heaven here who obey God. We're talking about fallen angels. We're talking about demons. And so demons are taking earthly women, marrying them, and producing this offspring, at least according to the fallen angel view. Now, the term sons of God is often used to describe angels. For example, in Job chapter 1, verse 6, and 2, verse 1, and 38, 7, talks about this 
particular date where the sons of God come and meet with God and Satan is there amongst them. And so this view that these uh, sons of God are fallen angels is actually the Jewish interpretation. So what the Hebrews believed all through the years and it was the view of the early church. Uh, later on in the Middle Ages, uh, or even actually before the Middle Ages, you had uh, St. Augustine and others took this view of the, of the Sethite uh, position, and then more recently it's been the royalty position. Uh, but interestingly, both Second Peter and Jude mention angels that have done something really bad. Doesn't say what, but they did something really bad and have actually been imprisoned for it. And we read, for example, in Jude chapter 1, verse 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So these angels did something and involved leaving their estate, and they are under God's judgment. They're not free to roam around and tempt people and do demonic activities. They are imprisoned all the way up to that great judgment day where they will be ultimately judged and cast into the lake of fire. Well, let's talk about this word giant for just a minute. What is a giant? You say, well, Dino Day, that's easy. It's a really big guy. Yeah, but giant is a relative term. So, for example, I've traveled to Cameroon, Africa, and there's pygmy tribes there, and I interacted with a tribe called the Baca Pygmies, and none of these guys even come up to my shoulders. Now, I'm five foot nine. I'm not a terribly tall person, but next to them, I'm a giant. Conversely, if I were to stand next to these NBA players, I would look at them like as if they were a giant. By the way, the tallest pro basketball player ever is a guy by the name of Sun Ming Ming. Sun Ming Ming was a Chinese player. He was recruited by the Harlem Globetrotters in 2007. Sun Ming Ming was seven foot, nine inches tall. Here's a picture of Sun Ming Ming playing on a Chinese basketball league. I think you'd agree with me that most people would look at Sun Ming Ming, almost eight feet tall, and say, yeah, that guy's a giant, at least relative to us. But he's not the biggest guy ever to have lived. Some modern people have gotten much taller, approaching even the heights of some of the ancient giants. But these people have a disease that's called giantism. Giantism is a disease that affects your pituitary gland. It's a malfunction, so it keeps secreting those growth hormones. You never kind of plateau out after puberty. You just keep on growing, and it's called hypertrophy. It's uh, a disease called giantism. They're unique individuals. Uh, it's not something that's off, uh, throughout a family. It's definitely a, a disorder. And for example, the largest person, the Guinness Book World Record person is a guy named Robert Wadlow, and he was 8 foot 11 inches, just shy of 9 feet tall. Here's a picture of me standing next to a, uh, a wax of Robert Wadlow. By the way, this guy's got a 37 double A shoe. Here's a picture of the Wadlows, including Robert, next to his family, and you'll see it's not a family of giants. He has this unique uh, issue called giantism. And by the way, he didn't even live to age 30. It's, it's very debilitating. You have heart difficulties, and he had to wear these leg braces even to get around. And so it was just difficult for him to even maneuver and, and to, to, uh, to, to get around. Uh, here's Robert Wadlow as a young man, and you can just see he's this really big guy, really, really tall. Now, it's not just these giant people. But as we dig in the fossil record, we discover that there's all sorts of giant organisms that are kind of fossilized, frozen in time, a snapshot of the pre-flood world. This decline in giant organisms is due to things like genetic mutations and environmental degradation, but it fits well within the creation model. The things aren't getting better. At best, they're holding level. At worst case, they're degenerating. Now, you might say, well, Dave, people are taller as a rule now than they were in the Middle Ages. Well, that's because of nutrition, in some cases, modern medicine. But the difference is, there were these huge giants in the distant past without modern nutrition and without modern medicine. And that's a difficulty within the evolution model. See, the evolutionists want you to think of primitive as smaller, but it's not true. 
No, no, I like to think of it primeval is larger. We dig in the fossil record, we see monster millipedes and behemoth bunnies and giant guinea pigs and huge hedgehogs and stupendous sharks, king kangaroos. All these things are bigger, healthier, and lived longer in the distant past. But even if the humans were bigger in the pre-flood world, these Nephilim, these giants that are talked about in the book of Genesis, were bigger than the rest. They were bigger than their peers. They were exceptionally tall. So if most people were larger in the pre-flood world, how tall were the Nephilim? The answer we have to give is we're not sure. We honestly really don't know. We don't have any for sure skeletons. The Bible doesn't tell us how big they are. Uh, the best I can say is there's a possibility of a, uh, a human bone that was found in the 1960s. There's a construction crew in Turkey. Uh, allegedly, they ran into an ancient burial ground. The engineer reported they found this giant, giant fossilized human bone. And it's a femur. It's the, it's the big leg bone right there. Bam. And uh, they reported it was a 47-inch femur. We don't have the bone, but they reported it. Uh, so you scale that up, this guy would have stood over 14 feet tall. Uh, similar bones have allegedly been found in other Middle East nations. Are these pre-flood Nephilim remains? Maybe, perhaps. Uh, the answer is we just don't have anything 100% for sure. So we talked about the pre-flood Nephilim. But then there's a second time where giants figure prominently in biblical history. And this is the time when the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt in the Exodus. They're going through the wilderness, and they're coming to the promised land. And as they get up there to the edge of the promised land in an area called Kadesh Barnea, Moses says, let's send out some spies just to kind of check out the land and report back to us as to what's going on. Uh, we want to know what we're up against. So these spies, they go out for some time, they mill all over, they bring back some fruits, and they have a report, and they say, there are giants in the land. And of course, the Israelites get scared, they're frightened, and this race of warlike giants, they're called the Anakim, the Anakim. Now, there was apparently this one guy named Arba, and these were his children. The Anakim come from a guy by the name of Arba. He's like the great granddaddy of this clan of giants. And they're named after his most famous son, a giant named Anak, or maybe Anak. Uh, but uh, the Anakim. So in Hebrew, if you want to make a word plural, you add an I-M ending to it. Now, if there were two Davids up here on stage and we both were walking over to this side of the stage, walking to your right, we would say the David, the Davids in English, or the Davidim in Hebrew are walking to the right. So when it's the Anakim, they're just kind of generally named after this guy, Anak, and it's just the plural. And of course, Joshua 14, 15, Joshua 15, 13, Joshua 21, 11. As I said, the Bible has a lot to say about giants. For example, in Numbers 13, 33, we read, the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So these spies that scout out the land come back and report to the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, there's giants in the land. We saw the Anakim. And I'm sure they might be exaggerating just a bit. <laughs> we're the size of grasshoppers, and you know. But the point is, these guys aren't head and shoulders over us. They're way up there. These are seriously tall people. These are really big dudes. And because of fear, then the Jews rebelled against God. They refused to conquer the promised land because of the frightening giants. I want to remind you that at this point in their history, the nation of Israel had already seen warfare. They would not easily have been intimidated unless these giants really were very large, and very numerous. And it seems that they lived in groups, in particular areas. There were clans, there were families of giants. It's not like Robert Wadlow where you had a genetic freak. This is a whole family, a whole clan, a whole group, a tribe of giants. In Joshua 1, 15, verse 8, Joshua 15, 8 says, And the border went up to the top of the mountain that lies before the valley of Hinnom westward, which is at the edge of the valley of the giants northward. 
So here this whole valley is full of these Anakim. Now eventually, after wandering 40 years in the wilderness, children of Israel would come in, trusting God, believing God, under the leadership of Joshua. And uh, Joshua and Caleb would drive out these giants. But it seems that a few of these giants weren't killed. They ran away. And they found sanctuary amongst the Philistine cities on the seacoast. Philistines had several cities along the seacoast, and Israel mostly conquered the central region. They never conquered the Philistines. And so you have Gath and uh, Ekron and Gaza and these different cities of the Philistines there on the seacoast. And they were never conquered by Joshua's armies, a mistake that would later come back to haunt Israel. Joshua 11, verse 22 says, There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod there remained. These are all Philistine cities. Now, besides the Anakim, the Bible talks about other tribes of giants in the land. One in particular is called the Rephaim. These guys didn't live in the central area there, up in the hill country. They lived way up in the northeast, near what would today be Lebanon. And Deuteronomy 2 says, the Rephaim were strong and tall, like the Anakim, and King Og of Bashan was described as the last of the Rephaim. Isn't that a great name for a giant? Hi, my name is Dino Dave. Hey, I'm Og. Great name for a giant. Now, we're not told how tall Og is, but I'm betting he was the tallest giant around. Why? Because we're told how long his bed is. <laughs> and he has an iron bed that is 14 feet long and 6 feet wide. He would likely have stood about 12 feet tall. They're not going to waste a lot of iron in those days. And uh, Deuteronomy 3.11 talks about Og's iron bed. After the Israelites killed him, his bed was so significant, this bed was put on display and people came to see Og's bed. Here's what it would look like for Dino Dave to be laying in Og's massive bed. Can you imagine a 14-foot bed? So let's just say Og is 12 feet tall. What would it be like to walk up to a person that's 12 feet tall? Here's a picture of Dino Dave standing next to a 12-foot plastic human skeleton. And when I walk up to that, I felt a little bit like a grasshopper. I mean, wouldn't that be intimidating in a day of hand-to-hand -hand combat? where you both have weapons, and you've got to approach this fella, and he's got this massive spear, and you guys are going to clash for your lives. You see, it's not just height. Everything scales up on these giants. This guy's putting this guy together, you know, this giant. We needed a ladder, and his skull would, like, you know, be double the size of, triple the size of my head. It would easily fit down over my head and almost over my shoulders. If you scale it up, he'd weigh about 1,000 pounds. He might not be the fastest guy to the battle, but man, when he got swinging that sword, look out. The power of a 12-foot giant. No wonder the Israelites were intimidated. Now, giants were not restricted just to the area of Canaan that Israel would occupy. The Bible records other races of giants known in the Middle East at the time. There's the Emims, the Horims, the Avims, and the Zamzamims. Isn't that a great name for giants? Zams and memes in Deuteronomy chapter 2. And all these different clans were killed off by other nations. For example, in Deuteronomy 2, 10 and 11, it says this, The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many, and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants. So you've got several separate races of giants going on. Again, this is why they were so intimidated. There's a lot of giants, and these guys are really tall. They might be saying, Dino Dave, wouldn't there be some records in history if this is true? There's all these giants. Shouldn't we read about it somewhere besides the Bible? And the answer is, we do. Giants were known in secular art in the history of the Middle East. These giants became godlike heroes in the various nations that they ruled and led in battle. Now, not everybody in the land was giants, but the giants became these men of renown, the rulers the captains, 
they were celebrated as the military and the political heroes. For example, Marduk of Old Sumer is said by secular accounts to have been a giant. Here's an ancient carving, and you see uh, Marduk there. And I mean, this might be a bit exaggerated. He's by people just coming over his knees. Uh, but, you know, maybe it's not too far off. But this guy was supposedly a giant. Uh, the Mesopotamian hero Gilgamesh was said to be a giant. He was so strong he could crush a lion. And you have this picture here of him with his sling and just kind of holding a lion there in the crook of his arm and like ready to strangle this thing. Supposedly, uh, Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, stood 12 feet tall. You might say, well, Dino Day, they're exaggerating their kings. And the kings, of course, want everybody to think of them as gods. And so they're exaggerating themselves to their people. But it's not always that case. For example, the ancient Egyptians have a record of giants, and it's in the land of Canaan. And the armies of the Egyptians go up to conquer in the land of Canaan, and they encounter giants. The Egyptians call them the Shazu. And here, I'm going to show you in just a second, is a carving of a bunch of Egyptians beating some Shazu prisoners. So they catch these two giants. And in the Battle of Kadesh in 1274, they are beating these giants that they got. And this is from the Egyptian temple of Ramses at Abu Simbel. I've actually been there and seen this depiction on the wall. And you're going to see these giants are taller than the Egyptians. And so, hey, they're telling the truth. These Egyptians are standing up, and the Shazu are sitting down, and they're as tall as the Egyptians. So they're about nine feet tall, these giants that were encountered in Canaan by the armies of ancient Egypt. Now, one of the other facts that's kind of interesting, the Bible talks about these giants. It says that they have six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. That's a condition that's still known sometimes today. We call it polydactyly. For example, here's a picture of a man from Cuba, and you see he's got six fingers on each hand. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 21 that some of these giants were the same way. And people asked him, they said, what was it like growing up with six fingers on each hand? He said, well, it's kind of handy. I could actually climb up the coconut trees faster than any other boys, and I was able to get the coconuts. Uh, so it didn't hamper him in any way, and it might be kind of cool if to have those extra fingers. Don't know. But I want to talk right now about the biggest giant story in all the Bible. You all know where I'm going with this. The story of the giant Goliath. This is the most famous giant story. Clearly gets the most uh, words in our historical accounts. David and Goliath. Wasn't the tallest. Probably about 10 feet tall. We're given that in 1 Samuel 17 verse 4. They went on a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, a cubit is a distance from your fingertips to your elbow. We don't know if it was a giant's cubit or if it was some regular person's cubit. I'm guessing if it was uh, going to be consistent, there had to be, you know, a regular person's cubit. They weren't going by giant's cubits. But this guy would have been a tall guy, something on the order of 10 feet tall. What would that be like for David to volunteer to fight this guy? Well, we're told in 1 Samuel 17, verse 7, the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. What does that mean? That means about 16 pounds. The spear head, the iron tip, weighed 16 pounds. Now, you might say, well, I could pick up 16 pounds, right? But put that out there on the tip of a sword and try carrying that for hours in battle and willing it to defend your life, uh, that'd be a little bit difficult for us to be able to do. And that shows that this guy is enormously strong. Now, it's very interesting. A farmer working the fields in the region near to the seacoast, not far from where the ancient cities of the Philistines was, was plowing through his fields, and all of a sudden his plow struck on something. He backed up his team and moved the plow off, and then he was able to dig down in there, and he actually uncovered a trove of ancient weapons, buried axe heads and spears that must have been hidden there, perhaps when the Israelites were conquering the Philistines, trying to save their spears for their own use for later. 
But what's very interesting, these spears are now on display in the Israel Museum, and amongst them are some giant spearheads. Here's a picture of them from the Israel Museum. And so the journal that published this find claimed the spears were too big to wield. They must have just been used for decoration. Now, my friends, they didn't have a lot of spare metal to be using for decoration in those days. And if you look at these spears, they've got notches taken out of them. Man, they, they use these to thump somebody's head. These were well used. And so somebody was wielding giant spears. Here's a picture of Dino Dave holding a replica of Goliath's spear. I'm telling you, it's heavy. It's hard to even hold up a straight out like that for any amount of time. Who was wielding this thing? Maybe Goliath or one of his buddies? So the story of young David triumphing over Goliath has become an inspiration down for the generations. By God's grace, giants can be defeated. And while all the rest of Saul's army ran and hid themselves, David said, hey, there's a greater cause. And in the name of God, we can conquer this giant. And of course, with God's help, he did. Now, altogether, there were four descendants of the giants at Gath. Remember, this is multiple generations down from when they escaped from Joshua and Caleb and ran over there, and they had their children. And so you have multiple descendants from the giants that are at Gath. They were killed by David and his men. So these Anakim were clearly a race of giants, and they had giant children. It's very different from a genetic anomaly like giantism. Then we read in 2 Samuel 21, verse 20, there was another battle at Gath where there was a giant who loved to fight. He had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. So here we're seeing these giants loved to fight. They're just violent guys. They just like to smash people and just like to have a temper and just blast things and just make the force of their presence known. Violent, wicked men, giants that were used by the Philistines to help intimidate Israel and use them in battle. So we talked about the pre-flood Nephilim. We talked about the post-flood giant races. Let's talk for just a minute about the American mound builders. The American mound builders. Now, you may never even heard of the American mound builders. What's that? Well, it's the Mississippian civilization. It's an early North American culture that predated the arrival of the European settlers. It flourished from around 300 BC all the way to about 1600 AD. Unlike the tribal Indians, who were by and large nomadic, the tribal Indians that were encountered by the Western settlers as they're moving in from Europe, these mound builders built really large cities, and they mined for copper. And this copper was used for jewelry and for armor. Now, the civilizations were, were wiped out, so we don't have a, a lot to go on. We just dig in these mounds, and we see these guys buried with jewelry and with, with copper armor. But the point is that there were thousands of these mounds. And they were typically built along rivers. So it was a very uh, a rich culture that, that liked the rivers and transported uh, themselves up and down through the rivers. And it covered at one point a region from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico and from Appalachia all the way out to the Great Plains. Covered, you know, uh, better than a third of the United States. And, and you got thousands of these large earthen mounds. And the surprising thing is most folks I talked to Never even heard of them. But this was a major culture in this country. And as the uh, settlers were beginning to move west in the 1800s, people began to find these mounds, these big earthen mounds, and begin to dig in them. In the 1800s, they began to excavate in these mounds skeletons. And some of them, not all, were very tall. We're talking 8 foot to 10 foot tall people found in these mounds. Now, sometimes the giant guy was in the middle, and there's a bunch of people buried around him, perhaps killed ceremonially, his servants and subjects, and they were normal height, but the big guy was in the middle, showing that maybe he was the ruler or maybe a captain or maybe a high priest or something like this. And uh, so these skeletons later on were either given back to the Indians, they're repatriated and they're reburied. Others have disappeared in our museums. And there's a, a book by Richard Dewhurst entitled The Ancient Giants Who Ruled America. The missing skeletons and the great Smithsonian cover-up. I'm not the kind of guy that normally buys into conspiracy theories. I, I tend to be very skeptical of that. I doubt very much that everybody could kind of cohort together and keep this story, you know, 
uh, a secret and, 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 and keep a, a conspiracy without the truth coming out that, hey, here's what really happened. But something kind of strange is going on here because these skeletons were very commonly known. These giant skeletons were very commonly known in the late 1800s. Uh, people knew about them. They were in the newspapers and even in some more rigorous publications that we'll talk about. Even Abraham Lincoln in a speech in 1848, talks about the giants that are found in the mounds. It's a speech about Niagara Falls, and Abraham Lincoln says this, quote, Niagara Falls, by what mysterious power is it that millions and millions are drawn from all parts of the world to gaze upon Niagara Falls? The eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. So this is common knowledge, and Lincoln just, you know, alludes to it in his speech on Niagara Falls. Now, that book is full of reports, scores of reports, from newspapers. And you might say, well, newspapers, okay, especially in the 1800s, given us some sensationalism, maybe exaggeration, maybe trying to draw people to their town, kind of have their famous day in history, and so we found this giant in the mounds out back in our town. But as I said, there's also some more rigorous publications that mention these giants and give specifics. For example, here is a report by J.W. Powell in the 12th Annual Report of the Bureau of Ethnology to the Secretary of the Smithsonian, 1890 to 91. And they say, while at work on a huge mound near Chillicothe, Ohio, archaeologists found a massive skeleton of a man. His mouth was stuffed with pearls, and his whole body was encased in copper armor. Here's another quote. This is from the Arkansas Archaeologist, a journal of the day. And it says, quote, the skeletons are very large and 7 to feet, 10 feet tall. One femur bone was unearthed that measures 29 inches in length. The skulls are extremely large. The jaw of one is such size that it would slip over my own and have considerable space to spare. Now, the biggest of all the Mississippian communities, the biggest mound builder, capital of all, was Cahokia. Cahokia was believed to be a major religious center located near present-day St. Louis. And you've got numerous mounds in that area. It's actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You can go there to just outside St. Louis, and you can see Cahokia. But the largest of these mounds is a mound called Monk's Mound. And this is worth seeing. It's the size of a football field, and it goes as high as 100 feet. This rivals the construction projects of the pyramids in the Giza Plateau of Egypt. And I find most Americans never even heard of it. It's really worth seeing. Monk's Mound. They figure that's 19 million cubic feet of earth there in this mound. Here's some mounds from Cahokia. I took this picture. I actually went there, and you can see these are really significant. They've probably uh, gone down a lot because of erosion. But here's Monk's Mound. You can see me standing next to it. It's taller than the trees there. Uh, this is a drone picture of Monk's Mound. You see there's multiple platforms. And this is what we think it probably looked like. There probably was this stockade fence around it, and people could go up and down if you had... Uh, the authority to do that. And up top might be perhaps the ruler or maybe a high priest uh, or maybe a temple where worship uh, took place. But there was this major community. And so Monk's Mount is kind of like the centerpiece, but then around it you have the uh, center of the, the community and a stockade fence uh, separating it off. And then lots of folks that are just common villagers, some even on mounds, that are living all around that at this area where the Mississippi River and the Missouri River come together, and it's this sacred site for this river-based civilization, the mound builders. I went there, and I said to the folks at the uh, exhibit hall, I said, I'm just curious. I have heard reports about the fact that there was discovered in some of these mounds really tall people. There were some giants. And the friendly park service people there said, well, we don't know what you're talking about. You know, there's some folks that have asked about that, but we don't have anything to tell you about that. We're not aware of anything like that. Uh, maybe there were some exaggerations in newspapers in the 1800s, but we, we just don't know anything about that today. Don't, don't have any skeletons, nothing to say. So I went walking through the museum, and there in Cahokia, at their museum, they have a display of stone axe heads. And the largest one, they say, weighs 30 pounds. 
Now, who's going to wield a 30-pound stone axe? My friends, do you know how much a modern-day axe would weigh or maybe a modern maul would weigh? Well, a hammer maul might weigh as much as 16 pounds, and you're going to have a hard time swinging that for very long. Uh, an axe that you might be able to use for some hours is going to weigh 8 pounds. This is a 30-pound stone axe head. Who's wielding that thing? Guy's got to be enormously strong. Must be something on an order of a giant. Now, here's a picture of an actual skeleton uh, by Ralph Glidden, and he's digging up skeletons in this ancient cemetery there on Cat Catalina Island. And you see a giant that scales up based on our knowledge of uh, Glidden's height. This giant's about 9 feet long nine feet tall. So actual photos of people dug up skeletons of a giant. Now what's interesting is we have some corroboration from the Indian legends themselves. Numerous Native American tribes have legends of bearded giants that were known to their ancestors. According to the Choctaw Indians, the Nahulu was a race of giants that lived near the shores of the Mississippi River. Choctaw ancestors fought with them after migrating from the west. So this kind of fits in with the fact that in some of these river civilizations, there were some of these giants. The Navajo Indians give a detailed history of the Starnaki people, describing them as a regal race of white giants endowed with mining technology who dominated the west and enslaved lesser tribes and had strongholds all through the Americas. One more report. This is the Paiutes. The Paiutes perhaps have the most detailed and maybe the most credible story of a race of cannibalistic red-haired giants. They call them Saitaka. The Paiute tribes became vexed with these giants capturing their villagers. Well, listen, they're cannibalistic. I, I can understand why the Paiutes might not like this. So they put together a big coalition of all the different Indian tribes in the area. They start this war against the giants. And over the course of time, they're killing a lot of these giants, and they, they got the last ones trapped in this cave, according to their legend, Lovelock Cave. And the, the uh, Paiutes say, hey, come out, surrender. And these giants yell from within, nothing doing. And so the Paiute get a whole bunch of brush, according to their legend and their, their, their histories, and they pile it all the entrance, brush and wood, and they start a big fire, and they annihilate the last of these red-haired giants. Well, here's a picture of Lovelock Cave there in Nevada. And uh, we don't find any giant remains in the cave, but we do find a number of uh, Indian remains and some interesting artifacts that have been found in there. Now, I've visited a number of these mound builder locations. And I'd like to mention one other one. This one's really fascinating to me in particular. Dino Dave loves things dinosaurian. And there's a... Uh, a mound builder site called Moundville, Alabama. Wasn't well, that a great name for a Mississippian mound builder site? Moundville, Alabama. At its peak, it was a really large city. It would have been rivaling Aztec sites in Mexico. There are 29 massive flat top earthen mounds arranged very carefully around a vast central plaza. And uh, these mounds would have served as platforms for civic and ceremonial structures. And they're laid out uh, very particularly. And you see me standing on top of one of these mounds. You can climb up on top of them, and uh, you can see these mounds that are laid out across the central plaza there in Moundville, Alabama. This is a reconstruction of what we think they might have looked like at the time. Again, you have this stockade fence going around it. It's going right down to the river, and uh, this, uh, this big central uh, mound there for maybe religious or perhaps for the ruler to live on. Um, but as they were digging in some of these mounds, we're talking about the 1870s. Today, they won't let you do that. They want to respect the, uh, the Indians that have laid claim to these uh, people that are buried in these mounds, and, and they, they don't want things disturbed. Uh, but in the 1870s, they were digging in some of these mounds there in Alabama. And the Alabama Historical Society reported in 1876 that Hezekiah Powell discovered the skeleton of a man that measured nine feet from head to heel as he lay in the ground. And this was reported in an article entitled The Smithsonian Institution's Investigation at Moundville in 1869 and 1882. And it was published in the Mid-Continental Journal of Archaeology. Pretty trustworthy. And it gives a lot of details about a giant that was discovered there in Moundville. 
But they also find, or they found in some of these mounds, some really interesting ceramic pots. Several ceramic pots are found in Moundville. Etched on the sides of these pots are flying serpents. That is, a snake-like form, I'll show you a picture of this in just a minute, with a wing coming off it, kind of a ribbed wing. Doesn't look like feathers, looks like more like a ribbed wing, and then a head on the end with teeth. And at the end of the snake's tail, a widening, a widening. Now, what could this be? Some have said, well, it's just a mythical animal, kind of, you know, a rattlesnake combined with a feathered bird or something like this. But what about the teeth? It just seems a little bit odd. I'm going to suggest to you that perhaps this is the thunderbird of ancient Indian tradition. Look at this picture. It looks an awful lot like what we would today believe a Ramphorhynchoid pterosaur to look like. Now I have here a reconstruction of a Ramphorhynchoid pterosaur. One of the unique features is this widening on the end of the tail. It's called a tail vein. And they have these ribbed wings and they've got lots of teeth in their beak and they have this really big eyeball. So it's a pretty good reconstruction I think and this is not just uh, found here at Moundville but all other sites as well uh, what the archaeologists call these flying serpents. Uh, so I, I can't pass it, but mention that. Here's an actual pot. You see that whiting on the end of the tail, the teeth in the mouth. Some of these flying reptiles even had head crests, which is known amongst some of the pterosaurs. It seems these ancient people were familiar with pterosaurs that were still alive at that time in the Americas. Well, I need to wrap things up. In conclusion, a couple of points. Number one. Paleontology reveals a fossilized world of giant creatures that roam the earth. Clear evidence for the creation model. Number two, archaeology shows that at multiple points in history, there were giant races of people who were much bigger than the average, just like Genesis chapter 6 suggests. Number three, these giants became rulers and captains Men of renown, just like the Bible says. My friends, if we just believe the Bible, we're going to be ahead of the paleontologists and ahead of the archaeologists. Why? Because the Bible is God's word, and it's trustworthy. You can take it to the bank. Science and even our understanding of history might change and morph, but God's word doesn't change. And when God says there were giants in those days, there were giants, and we can count on it. I want to conclude with just a quick devotional thought here. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says this, as God is speaking to Samuel. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, for the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. You see, you and I are intimidated by things on a horizontal platform, especially things that can hurt us. We look at somebody that's really tall and say, oh, I'm scared of that person, especially in a day of hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's intimidating, right? That person could seriously hurt me. But God isn't intimidated by somebody's height. God made the whole universe. And when we keep that picture in our mind, the greatness of our God, the strength of our God, like David of old, we can go out and conquer giants in God's name and for his glory. Now you might be saying, well, why does God even allow there to be giants? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why God allowed there to be giants in David's life. Why God allowed there to be giants in the life of these ancient Israelites. Oh, God could have had a pygmy race there in Canaan, and, and as the children of Israel came up to the promised land and sent out their spies to report, they could have come back and said, oh, these guys are really easy, man. We could just roll over them. This is going to be a piece of cake. It's going to be a walk in the park. God could have allowed that. But God allowed there to be these giants that intimidated them. Why? I don't have a complete answer to that. Why does God allow giants in our lives? I'm talking in a metaphor, metaphorical sense. Why, why does God allow a giant of despair and depression in my life? Why does God allow a giant of financial trouble and distress and, 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 and difficulty in my life? 
Why does God allow this health giant and this suffering in my life? I can't tell you the answer to all this. But can I suggest it might be that God is testing our faith? Whether we're going to look at things at a horizontal perspective and be intimidated like those children of Israel were, or whether we're going to lift our eyes up to the greatness of our God like David did and say, I got this. By His grace and by trusting in Him and keeping my focus on Him, the giants can be conquered. I'm looking at some young people today that have the potential to be giant slayers for the glory of God. But we can't just be looking at things at a horizontal level. We've got to lift our eyes up to the greatness of our God. And God is searching for people that has that heart. People that have that heart of faith like David and Joshua and Caleb that weren't intimidated by giants. He said, bring them on in the power of God. They can be conquered. Do you have that trust in God today? God wants to do a great work with you. Very few, very few, the New Testament tells us, amongst those chosen by God are worldly wise, wealthy, the strong. No, God has chosen the weak things of this world. David was a shepherd boy, right? Later on he'd be a warrior, but never like a giant, not like Goliath. But God is looking for someone who has the heart of a David, a man after God's own heart. And by his grace, giants can be conquered.